is Andrea Kuypers, and I'm reporting to you with a very special episode of Quidgets TV. We're, in this episode, we're going to be focusing on education. Because without the right education, you're just going to grow up to be a big dumb person. And you're out on a science website that promotes education, so I'm going to go out on a crazy limb and assume that's not what you want. With me here today is Dr. Philip Janowitz of California State University, Fullerton. He's an organic chemistry professor and a researcher in science education. So, Phil, um, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? I'm doing fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Excited to have you on here. I'm excited to be here. Right? <laughs> so, Phil, um, what made you decide to teach one of the hardest subjects in science education? Um, I love organic chemistry. It was really weird. I was in, in college. I was originally a, um, a brain and cognitive science major. So I'm learning all about neuroscience. I'm learning about how the brain works. And I've always been fascinated with how people learn. You know, why is it that I can do calculus, but I can't remember where I put my keys? Right. You know, why is it that my brain functions that way? Why is it that my sister, who's wonderful at fashion, understands what goes well together, but I have no idea what goes well together? <laughs> what is it that we're so similar genetically, but how are we so different in our brains? Mm -hmm. So I've always been fascinated with how people learn. And then um, towards the junior year of, of college back at MIT, it was... I'm kind of bored. I'm gonna. I've got a free period from Monday to Friday at noon. So I went there, and it was organic chemistry. My friend was taking the class. She said, "Come on, come on by." I'm like, "Okay, sure." I walked by, and it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. I actually liked it. I actually enjoyed doing structure. I mean, it's Nobody weird. It's weird. That. Yeah, I know. I, no lo I love it, but people always look at me like I have a butt on my face when mm -hmm. I when I. When I get I, that look yeah. a lot myself. Yeah. But <laughs> it's it's really fun. Like, it was so much fun. You know, just problem solving and and figuring out the world and thinking, what I just figured out there is how we make plastics. Or the, the water bottle that I'm drinking from was made using the chemistry that we just did. And I loved it, but my friends found it really difficult. They're like, this is so hard, how can you do this? And I'm thinking, this makes sense to me. It, why is it this makes sense? So I wanted to go into education to help other people learn how to do organic chemistry. I mean, it's so, it's so important and fundamental to any life sciences, but it's so difficult for so many people, and I think it has to be made easier. It makes so much sense in my head. I, I, I've got to help other people understand it. Right. It's, it's, I, that's why I do it. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Yay, yay, that's so fantastic. I know, because organic chemistry is a very, very hard subject. I know. I'm in it right now, but I do love it, but everybody just looks at me like I'm freaking crazy when I say that. But yes, but thank you, Phil. Yeah, without teachers like you, then we're, we would all just be dum dums who believe everything that Dr. Phil says. Not you, Dr. Phil. Mm -hmm. This Dr. Dr. Phil's Dr. Phil. okay. I've got right. hair. Right. <laughs> Exactly. So can you tell us a little bit about your research? Yeah, so I do uh, research in two different areas, both related to science education and organic chemistry. So I, uh, one research project is looking at how people use three-dimensional modeling tools when learning how to solve organic problems. So for example, um, molecules exist on paper, we draw them in two dimensions. Anytime we draw on paper, we're drawing two dimensions on there. Mm -hmm. But molecules, yeah. like people, were in 3D. So we've got three dimensions that we're dealing with. But thinking about three-dimensional objects in our brains, our spatial reasoning is very difficult. So I'm looking at how students are using these three-dimensional modeling tools and looking at their spatial ability and how they're using these three-dimensional tools to solve these problems. It's it's fascinating to, to look at how they're solving the problems because we're using an eye tracker. So, do you know much about an eye tracker? No, what is an eye tracker? Okay, so is that like something that you're going to stick on my eyeballs? Or? I will not be sticking anything on your eyeballs. That's a good thing. No invasive techniques. Yes. <laughs> so, no clockwork orange. No clockwork orange. No clockwork orange. Yes. So, <laughs> what we're doing, it's really cool. We've got, the, we've got the, the screen. So, you're basically looking at a computer screen. So, as you're looking at the computer screen, there are two IR cameras beneath it that are looking at the curvature of your eyeball and detecting the color change between your iris and your pupil. And based on that, in the, in the uh, triangulation of the different IR detectors, we can tell what you're looking at on the screen. Cool. So it's literally tracking your eye movement. Because we know that what you're looking at tracks with what you're paying attention to. And what you're paying attention to correlates with what you're thinking about, your cognition. So we're getting an indirect measurement of what you're actually paying attention to. And we can make educated guesses on what you're thinking about. 
So as you're using this tool, I can tell if someone's a novice, for example, they've never seen this before. They'll be you know, looking at the screen here. They'll be looking at the, at the board. They'll be, boom, they'll, their eyes will be darting all over the place because they have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. But if they actually do know what's going on, they'll focus on the salient features and spend more time, for example, on the queue. You, you've probably seen the queue on here before. You would focus more time on it. Um, and because of that, we're able to chunk the data, as it's called, better, to focus on those salient features. So we can get a, an idea of who's a novice and who's an expert. And, how's, and we interview people afterwards to see how okay. they're using these tools. Because not only we can tell what you're thinking about, but actually ask you what you're thinking about and provide insight to how people are literally solving problems. Nice. Yeah. It's, 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 that's we're looking amazing. into the brain. Yeah, we're, we're looking actually into the looking brain. into somebody's with, brain. Yeah. Without actually getting in there and <laughs> opening it up. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so that's that's one of our, our big projects that we're looking at. We have some really great data we're working up now. I don't um, we're still we're still working it up at the moment, but uh, we're seeing that students who are using these three-dimensional tools are performing signi statistically significantly better than those who are using the two-dimensional objects without our rotational tools. We're, and that's even controlling for their spatial abilities going into the test. Nice. So using these tools has been shown to be statistically significantly better, to better understand organic chemistry. So uh, that that's opens up a whole world of using these um, the 21st century tools uh, for uh, for education, which I'm, I'm a big fan of. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's the big research project right there. I love it. <laughs> that's fantastic. So how do you test the, pe uh, the people on the two-dimensional objects? Do you have also another computer screen that they do? or So they're looking at the same computer screen. So um, it's um, we have a projection of, for example, as... As you can see, uh, potentially see up here, we have different structures that are drawn with lines and 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 uh, letters and whatnot. And that's organic chemistry. That's all the organic chemistry right here. This is this is how penicillin works. <laughs> um, so um, we're looking at that screen, and we but we don't provide a three-dimensional model of the tool, say, to the to the right of it. So those in the two-dimensional group don't have that model that they can work off of. So um, we're just seeing how, how they can rotate this molecule in their head without the aid of any tool. Nice. So do you want to develop your own software then from this, or what kind of applications are you looking into? So the big application here is there's already a lot of free stuff out there. I'm not, I mean, education costs too much. It costs way too much. So I want to use as many free things that are out there as possible. And there's a really great free tool, JMOL. It's an open source program uh, by a professor at St. Olaf University in Minnesota. And uh, it's a way to image three-dimensional molecules for free. And Neat. anyone can download it. Anyone can download JMOL, J-M-O-L. Anyone can do it right now. It's, it's free. Um, and you can use these tools um, to, to enhance education. So one of the goals is to use these free programs that are out there as a way to inform our teaching. To say, as um, whether it's with a computer program online, whether it's a person in the classroom or small groups, whatever the case may be, that you can use these uh, these JMOL three-dimensional models to better improve your learning, to better improve your spatial reasoning. Because if you can improve your visual spatial reasoning, sure, that's through organic chemistry, but you're improving your visual spatial reasoning in everything that's out there. I mean, whether it's okay, how do I get from from here to the grocery store? Your visual spatial reasoning is being used to turn right and then I'll turn left because I know the building is on that side of the street. That's using the same abilities of rotating a molecule in your head. So it only can benefit every single part of your of your existence. Just every yeah, single part of your existence. All That's it. Yeah. Just that. Yeah, just, just that. All of it. Just, just that. All. No. <laughs> So getting back to teaching, you know, because I've gone through quite a few teachers myself, what would you say makes a good educator in this day and age? Educator in this day and age? Um, know your audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, from, from theater, from anything, it's know your audience. Right. And know who you're teaching for, who you're educating for. And one of, well, one of the big things I noticed when I was in school is that I, I was an undergrad back in the early 2000s, and many of my professors um, got their PhDs in the 80s, uh, 1980s, for example. Uh, not eight, some 1880s, I'm sure, but uh, <laughs> 1980s. There's always that one. Yeah. Yeah, there's always <laughs> some. And um, they were educating for people in the 1980s. They were educating for people in the 1970s. 
and they weren't educating for me in the 2000s. And keep in mind, I'm, an, I'm a, a student in the 2000s. I'm going to be getting a job in the late 2000s, in the 2010s. I'm going to be hoping to solve problems in the 2020s. I mean, in, in the 1970s, you know, we had no idea AIDS would be a big epidemic. Right. So no one was taught about AIDS, about HIV in the 70s, yet that's what people spent their careers working on in the 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s, and, and still today. So we can't train people for what we already know. We have to train people for the future, for the unknown. So I can't train you for the unknown by memorization. Right, right. You can memorize the past, but you can't memorize the future. Absolutely. It's impossible to do. So training you in skills, training the modern student for skills that are going to make them succeed, or hopefully make them succeed, in whatever setting they put themselves into. Uh, whether it's through problem-solving skills, the visual-spatial reasoning skills, through writing, through communication. Communication is so incredibly important. You can be the smartest person in the world, but if you can't communicate to someone else your science, then they don't think you know anything. Right, right. So science communication, uh, like, like, like my idol Bill Nye, it's a big deal. It's a huge so, deal. The Neil Grass Tyson. Wow. Exactly. I mean, well, being able to communicate your science is so big. So communication skills, problem-solving, um, and, and, and visual spatial reasoning, all these are skills that we can, as educators, can help instill and nurture in, in students so that way they succeed in whatever that happens to be. I, I don't want to educate someone for 2015 or 2010. I want to educate someone for the unnamed future, right. whatever that happens to be, because that is the point of education. Right. That's the point. Right. So do you think that um, future educators should allow their students to be on the internet while they take tests? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, absolutely. We use the internet today. I mean, you're probably watching this on the internet, I would imagine. So uh, I, I would hope so. Maybe, maybe I'm an abacus yeah. somewhere, but um, it's, we're using the internet so much. So why not learn to use the internet well? I mean, there's so much stuff on the internet. There's a lot of bad stuff on the internet. There's a lot of good stuff on the internet. So learning to use your resources wisely is vitally important to succeeding in the modern modern age and in the future age. Because, I mean, there, there are so many people who will be going out there and looking at science and saying, well, I saw some one, one guy's website had an article about, you know, oh, we shouldn't vaccinate our kids because of blah, blah, blah. And they'll believe it. They'll believe that nonsense. When we've known, then we've known for years vaccinations are wonderful because they prevent mass disease. What was the last time you had polio? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> we had vaccinated for for years. <laughs> so they're knowing how to parse through the bad information out there and get to the good information is a vital skill for anyone to learn, to be an informed member of society. So I love using the internet as part of any assessment tools for education and learning how to use the internet because you're always going to have it. What do I do when I don't know something? I go to you Wikipedia. Google it. Oh, yeah. Google it. Go to yeah. Wikipedia. I'll yeah. look it up. Right. I don't need to memorize all these things because guess what? My phone has that. I can ask right. Siri and it's already on there. Right. So learning how to use Siri is going to be beneficial. Learning how to use Wikipedia. How to not just go after the first thing that you see and accept it as truth. Go to that first thing that you see and learn more about it. For example, my, when, when my dog was sick, I didn't look at exactly one article about her spine. I looked at eight articles about her spine, and I saw seven of them agreed with one another. Right. So potentially, I have a good idea that those seven were the right way. If I had gone to the eighth one and just took that as, as the gospel, then I probably wouldn't have been as informed. I couldn't have made an informed decision for my little girl. Right. So, Learning, so using your e internet wisely is a valuable tool. Using all of your resources wisely is a valuable tool. It's so huge, because otherwise Food Babe and, you know, Dr. Oz or whatever get to educate you, and that's what creates more dumb people in the world, and mm -hmm. we do not need more dumb people. Do not be Dr. Oz, do not be Food Babe. Ugh. And please don't, don't do sue it. us, we're a nonprofit, mm -hmm. okay, and we're here for science. Mm -hmm. We love science. Actual science. Actual real science. Actual real science, okay. So what kind of, that's amazing, because that's exactly what I was just going to ask you about. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, so what kind of things can you give to our viewers, you know, that are resourceful tools when they are just like pulling out their phone to Google, uh, I don't know, uh, G, um, GMOs. <laughs> to, to, to Google GMOs. Yeah, to Google GMOs, you know, because that is one of the top
topics, as you guys all know, as my Quidditchonians, you know, that is something that I am huge on because it is just such like a misinformed uh, mm -hmm. thing right now. I mean, it's a misinformed topic. Yeah. Always read more. Do we ever truly know something? I'm gonna get a little philosophical here. That's okay. No. I'm gonna get philosophical yeah. here. Yeah. Do we ever truly know anything? No. We have a lot of information that points towards what we think is the truth. Right. So we can have all of the, all of these things, but we will never truly 100% absolutely know. We could, but we could still make informed choices. Right. So when it comes to the to the GMO debate, for example, read lots of things. Read opposing viewpoints. Absolutely, read opposing viewpoints. I definitely want to read opposing viewpoints. Uh, not because they're each equal 50-50, but to see which one holds up scientifically and which one does not. Scientifically, that is the key word. Science is black and white, okay? Anybody can go on the internet and post at GeoCities. I don't even know if they still make GeoCities anymore. I but think anybody they do. can make GeoCities. <laughs> MySpace articles, you know, mm -hmm. I mean. My dog, can, well, my dog probably couldn't go on the internet, but he's tried before. You That'd know? be amazing. Yeah. That'd be pretty amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing, yeah. But, you know, but anybody can make a website. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm completely computer illiterate, and I have a website, so I work for a science website, so, you know. So be informed. Be, and think about the science. Ask the questions. Does this make sense? Is this, is this seem, lo does this seem logical at all? Is this realistic? Ask the questions. It can't hurt to ask questions. So I, that's that's the best thing to do. To definitely yeah. question, <laughs> question, to innovate using your technology. Question, question us, question him. Question, question everybody. Yeah, question, question everybody, and especially question yourself. Absolutely, question. Question yourself, yourself because thing you can evolve over over time. So, for example. Like Bill Nye, he had an article came out yesterday in which he's thinking about when it comes to GMOs. He's like, well, maybe there may be some issues out there. You know, are one hundred percent of them safe? We don't, honestly, we don't know the long term effects, so we can't say. the The most powerful answer in science is, I don't know. Right. We don't know a lot of things, but we can try to figure other things out. Um, so, I mean, if, I mean, more for GMOs. I mean, there was a, a massive virus that wiped out the wheat crops right. a long time right. ago. Otherwise, we wouldn't have wheat. We wouldn't have a lot of food if it wasn't for GMOs because mm -hmm. people keep multiplying, which means that we need more food to give these people. Mm -hmm. So you know what yeah. genetic modifications are? What? Mendel. Yeah. Gregor Mendel. Pea pods. Exactly. We've been doing it for years. Do you know how messed up a watermelon would look if it there wasn't for GMOs? Do you know what your banana, your morning banana, your morning special time banana would look like if it wasn't for GMOs? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Phil, for being here. It's been a pleasure, okay, educating people on education, on how better to educate yourself. My name is Andrea Kuypers, reporting to you with Quidgets, or reminding, reminding you not to be a dumb person. Check your science, check your facts.